mercy, your grace, and it just goes on and on. We're grateful to you for this time that we can sit and, and talk about the things of life, the things of kingdom, and that you would be with us as we do that, that you would be at the center of our conversation. And I pray, Father, that we would grow and learn about those things of, uh, of you and eternity. And I pray that you'd bless us now and ask you in the name of Jesus, amen. amen. All right. I'm going to need you to participate tonight. All right. This looks like a group that can gab, right? Oh, yeah, we probably will. We probably might. Yeah. Chris okay, Chris. Okay. What we're going to do is. Two weeks ago, I was in class, and I talked about faith and being faithful. And I'm going to recap that just a little bit, but I came to the end of it and didn't finish up the lesson. And so I'm going to continue on from there. But before I do that, I want to kind of recap what uh, we talked about a little bit. So if you were here, bear with me. And, uh, you know, they say repetition is the mother of education. So if we repeat it, maybe it'll stick better. We, oh, that's right. <laughs> I know, I know. Okay. What we're going to do is, well, let's just go over it. We talked a couple of weeks ago about the importance of your faith and about believing. And the essence of that was that we live by faith. And this is according to Galatians and um, Romans and Habakkuk and you know, a number of different places where it states that we live by faith. And so we defined what faith was and what faithful was, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But when you become a child of God by faith, you begin to live by faith. And it is because of the essence of that faith, your Christianity develops and becomes what it should. We talked about how when we gain faith, it was because we heard, we read the message of Scripture, that fantastic story. You know, before we came to faith, it was very obvious something was wrong. <laughs> we lived in a world that is evil. We live in a world that is destructive. We live in a world that has no hope. We see, in spite of our best efforts, that things just aren't the way they're supposed to be. And there's something in us, because I believe that it's in the heart of all men and women, there's something in us that tells us there's something more. And there's always the searching. It's interesting as you watch society, everybody's looking for something, looking for something. People get, you know, the lottery. They think that's it. It blows up. They think it's relationship. They think it's perversion. They think it's drugs. They think it's alcohol. They look for things that will fill this void, never realizing that it's something that's a hole in us that has to do with the spiritual. And when we get that revelation, it has tremendous impact on our lives because we begin to realize, oh my goodness, this fantastic story about a fallen world of fallen mankind and about our sin and it doesn't take much of that gospel for it to register and as it registers we begin to realize this is the answer and if we step across that line and say I believe faith starts you know it's been said that there's tons and tons of evidence about God and about Jesus but no one shred of proof that's the reason it's called faith. You step across. But it's not done mindlessly. It's not done to satisfy something wild emotionally. It's not because we see prosperity in this that if we live a certain way, it's going to have a great effect or what, you know, whatever. You begin to realize that hole is going to be filled. There's going to be something that's going to change in this. We, un we discussed uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago the undeniable need for us to read the word in order for that, uh, that uh, faith to take root. We have to understand this story. It has to make sense to us. There has to be a reason that we want to do this. And it has to register. So it's not a mindless thing. 
This has to make sense. And as you read and study the word, it's overwhelming how much sense it makes. Um, we talked about how God does not take pleasure in those that have faith and then begin to draw back. Uh, we looked at um, uh, the verse in, uh, let's see, it's in uh, Hebrews 10th chapter, it says, but my righteous one will live by, righteous ones will live by faith, and if he shrinks back, I will take no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve our souls. So here you begin to realize, okay, I have faith. But if you step into that, and if something doesn't happen, it says that if you shrink back, God has no flavor, uh, faith, uh, faith <laughs> has no, uh, uh, he doesn't uh, pl have pleasure in that. But what happens, it says that you can be destroyed. Now that's something, to have faith and to step into it, shrink back, and scripture says, that if you don't take hold, it will destroy you because of the faith being destroyed. Now that kind of speaks that you have faith, you let it go, and there's danger that you may not walk with God. So we talked about how that the day-to-day -day life in us has to grow, it has to be strengthened, it has to surge, it has to have something done with it. And so uh, we unite with other Christians, this is called church, for us to be able to grow. And there's lots of scripture that talks about the need for us to interact. There's times I need you because I'm really kind of having trouble with life. And you say, here Ray, remember the hope, remember the promise, remember this, remember how this has changed your life and changing your life. Look at the blessing, look at the good things that are happening in your life. And so we need the interaction of each other. We talked about the difference between faith and faithful, and we kind of defined faith as what you trust in and what you believe in. Faithful is the application of that faith in the day in and the day out. So if you have faith, that's one thing. But faithful means that you do something about it, that it's a growing, active thing. Faith is that that is, it has to be strong, it has to be growing, it's critical that that happens. Faith is responsible, dependable, and accountable. What does that mean, faith is uh, responsible? Somebody. I don't know. Oh. If you have a faith and it's responsible, what could you infer from that? No takers? It means that if it's responsible, if you're responsible with your faith, it means that it, it is, is it me doing that? Yeah, your hand hits the thing. Oh. That's why you pay me the big bucks. You get paid. I will give you, I will give you your quarter afterwards. Oh, now it's doing it on the back. What a, is there a way to keep that from happening? No, it's back there now. One, two, three. One, two, three. It's still on the green switch. Oh, that's not good. It's what? Yeah, it's all. Would you like the microphone? One, two, three, four. Try it. One, two, three. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. That okay, let's see if that'll work. If not, I might have to do the microphone. If it's responsible, it means you take responsibility. It, it interacts with you and you become responsible with it. 
If I give you $10 and you're irresponsible with it, you blow it, you mess with it, you don't treat it the way it's supposed to, you don't, you're not a good steward of it, you don't take care of it. But with faith, you've got to be responsible for it. You have to grow it, you have to be responsible for it, you have to nourish it. In other words, I have faith. Okay, it's all over me. I got faith. That's cool. I'm good. What now? I say one thing, but it has to transfer into action. And, and the other thing, too, it's dependable. Your faith has to be dependable. You have enough trust in what it is that you can depend on it to do what it's supposed to do, to transfer your life into the, into the things that it's supposed to, that you're supposed to grow. And you're supposed to be accountable with it. I can take my faith and make it into all kinds of things. It's irresponsible. You see that happen with people where they've got a faith and they, they go off into heresy and call it faith or whatever. It has to line up with something. It has to line up with accountable things. It has to be dependable. It has to be responsible to what it is in your character. So that's important. We also talked about temptation, about how Satan is in your face all of the time trying to get you tripped up. He accuses you. He try, does everything and he wants to... Uh, you know, he lies, kills, steal, destroy, as scripture says. He wants to mess with you. And temptation is always there. And then we spend some time talking about that because one of the things he attacks is your faith. The very first thing that happened with Eve was a question. Did God really say that? And if God really say that began to nibble at that faith that says, this isn't true, this isn't good, and it began to have problems. We talked about 1 Corinthians 10, that was such a great scripture, it says, no temptation has overtaken you except what uh, is common to mankind, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can hear, uh, what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. So where does the responsibility fall? On me and you. We have to be able to say, I will be accountable with this. I will touch this promise. You know, I want to blow up at somebody. I want to stick my foot in it. I want to get angry. I want to get even. I want to tell the little white lie. I don't want to take responsibility. I mean, you go down the line, promise is you got a way out of that. You don't have to do it. I just had something pop in my head about responsible, being responsible okay. with your faith. An example, I was thinking of a parent, a young parent, going to the grocery store and just saying, well, I'm going in and uh, I need to go shopping. I'm going to leave my little six-month-old baby out in the car what? heating. That is not being responsible That's with that good. child. And your faith means, and, and then to make it a similitude, is that faith, you have to take it with you. You have to move with it. You, you're responsible to care it for it, nurture it, make it grow, feed it. Um, so that's very good. That's a great example. You know, we tend to, lots of times we want to leave our faith places. I'm getting ready to walk into this. Well, I'm going to leave my faith on the table and I'm going to do whatever. Usually it's not that blatant, but we find ourselves all of a sudden slipping here and we're thinking, wait a minute, this isn't who I am. Listen to what's coming out of my mouth. Listen to the thoughts that are popping up into my head. Somehow the faith isn't working. Faith in Christ has to translate to action in our life. There's no way that there, we can get by without that. We talked about faith does not have to, uh, let's see. Yeah. We talked about that faith does not have a, res um, a response, may not be faith. In other words, if you have faith and there's no response to that and what happens in your life, Got to ask the question, do you really have faith? It's one thing, I said the prayer. I believe. 
walk out the door and nothing changes. Now I know. <laughs> Now I know that in the beginning there's a process. I've got a great friend, I think I mentioned him last time uh, from quite a few years ago that he said, man, I had dirty diapers for the longest time while I was trying to understand what I was supposed to be as a Christian. I was a babe, I was, well, I won't go into the adjectives he used, but you know, he was just into it all the time because somehow it wasn't getting applied. And then he'd realize, <laughs> Okay, got to clean up here. I got to get back online here about what faith is about. But you got to ask the question, if our faith does not create faithfulness, maybe we should ask, do we really have faith? Which is what I just said. Now who's going to ask that question and who's going to ask the, answer the question? You and I. With the help of your brothers, or you, somebody may come to me and say, Ray, <laughs> I know you believe in the Lord, but you know what you're doing, what you're saying, giving me some heartburn, you know, this isn't right. I gave you the example, remember I told you about the guy at the mill that called me into the office and said, I know you're a good man and you believe in the Lord, but the way you're acting sometimes and what you're saying, I'm concerned. And he did it in love and it stung. And I didn't like being talked to that way but it wouldn't let me go. I was really convicted and I left and it took a while and I began to say, okay, this has got to change with what I'm doing. And so anyway, we have to ask those hard questions. We have to realize our faith has to grow. You believe something's got to start happening. It has to grow. Our minds struggle to grasp the majesty of God and who he is, and now we try to see the fullness of Jesus. Jesus himself um, came to set things right in heaven and on earth, and he's working and he's changing and transforming us, and our spirit begins to break, it begins to change. Break in a good way, in other words, it begins to pull off the crustiness and the hardness, and we begin to become more sensitive to kingdom things. And it is all because of Jesus' business. The forgiveness of our sins, yes, our life here, yes, but what about the work done in heaven for us? I mean, this has been going on. We, we are excited. I get, you know, I get, to, uh, I get to be a new creature. God has forgiven me, totally forgiven me. Newborn, born again. What a wonderful gift. And it doesn't stop there, he continues to work. And he's left and he said, I've gone to prepare a place. As we speak, he's preparing a place for us. What a wonderful gift. Now I gotta tend to business and say, I want part of that. As my vision of Jesus grows, so does my faith. So that's the reason we're in scripture seeing what Jesus has done, what he is doing, the things that we're supposed to be about. There is a change in the way that we walk here on earth. It's got to happen. Where we go, what we do, the words we speak, the thoughts that are in our mind, the way we spend time with prayer and scripture, the way we spend time with the brethren, on and on and on. All of that begins to change. The thing is, is everything I just talked about boils down to what? Choice. You've got to decide I'm going to step into this. It has to begin to transform us. Hebrew, I mean, uh, James 2.29 says, for just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. Works doesn't save us, but works are an evidence that the faith is there. Our works are a consequence of a changed life. It begins to transform us in every way. We're going to talk about that. We observed that, and I was quoting from a, I got a lot of stuff from a, a, several different places where I was kind of studying this and see where were some of the places that I looked at. Um, Clark Robinson and his devotionals, Dr. Cole, Billy Graham, Christian Life Magazine, I was looking at several articles there. 
and of course the word is just reading and things kind of can be. But one of the things that was said in the maturity does not come with age, but begins with the acceptance of responsibility. I don't know about you, but I know some 80 year olds that are running around that then aren't even, aren't even close to what some of our grandkids are in terms of maturity. Right behind you. Some of you raised your hand. Did that mean that there was a problem or no, no? There was a quote that I saw a couple days ago that I really liked and it said some people, or yeah, some people grow up, others just get older. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And you know, every one of us, I think, gets accused of immaturity every once in a while. But um, anyway, it's a choice. But maturity does not come with age, but begins with the acceptance of responsibility. Accepting responsibility for your own sins and by your faith, asking forgiveness from God is the first step to spiritual maturity. When you ask for forgiveness, what's the key word that's involved in that process with God? Repentance, very good. What does repentance mean? Stop, turn around, go the other way, and you don't come back. Right? That's repentance. All right, go and sin no more, good. Now, so what happens if you do that, you turn around and pretty quick, you're turning back around. Do it again. You've got to keep doing it until it takes. You're responsible for that. Now, to play with that, flirt with it, and just goof off with that, well, well, God will forgive me, you know. You know, this bottomless grace thing that God will take care of things, you know. That's a dangerous place to flirt, don't you think? We can argue, well, I've, it covers everything, you know, God's going to take care of it all, one thing or the other. Are you willing to bet your spiritual life on that nonsense? Right. Yeah. <laughs> People of God are exhorted to mature in the faith by a process. And that's where we're headed tonight. There's a process to, in, to grow your faith. In other words, grow. Now, I want to emphasize, and I do this all the time, guess what? It's not the church's job to grow you. Yep, that's right. It's not Pastor T uh, Tim's job to grow you. It's not your husband or your wife's job to grow you. you if you've ever been around with Bev and I teaching marriage classes, I want you to understand that for one of the first things you're going to hear from me, it's not your job to fix your wife. Right. And it's not your job to fix your husband. What? There's one word I've got for that. Stop it. <laughs> That's not your job, not your responsibility. Your job is to do what? <laughs> that was two words. It was hyphenated. <laughs> Stop it. Okay, love your wife. Okay, love your wife. That's good. But it's not your job. If you're, what, pray, oh yeah, pray for them. Your job is to pray for them, but your job is to live in front of them what you're supposed to. I guarantee you, every one of you's got enough stuff to take care of without trying to fix the other person. Okay? You got enough to work on. Take care of yourself in the way that you're supposed to, and I guarantee you, it will begin to change your spouse. It'll begin to change your marriage. Well, I, that was all free. That was a little detour there. Yeah. <laughs> oh, boy, Hensley, right. I guess everybody's heard about Hensley or whatever, passing on. Oh, I sure miss him saying that, pass it on. You hadn't heard? Yeah, he passed on last week. But anyway, he's happy now. Yes, he is. But at any rate, Yes, Susanna. I oh, yeah. Oh, 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 oh. So I understand it's not our job to grow anyone or teach anybody, but would you disagree that it is our job to teach and assist? If we know something, that we should help that other person with what they're wanting to learn? Okay, yeah. You know, I, I, here, here's what I mean by that. Here, here, here's what it is. 
I see so many relationships, not just marriages, go down the tubes because what we do is we are in their face all the time trying to say, stop this, do this, I want this, this is what it's about, what you're doing is driving me crazy, one thing or the other. Now, should you talk about those things civilly and say, you know, boy, this is driving me a little crazy. Can we talk about this? But when we get into those battles to where we're trying to, you know, if he would just do this, I would be happy. If she would just do that, I would be happy. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, right. Amen. You know, John, John has said that about you. Oh, <laughs> I taught him well. Um, but um, what I really mean is, like, I'm talking about me in particular, right? Uh, we are new to, to church, if you will. Um, we had not been in church for 20 years. And... So I know it's not Pastor Tim's or anybody else's responsibility to, to grow our faith, but I look okay. towards everybody else to help me okay. in growing uh, yeah, yeah. my faith. Okay, I see where you're coming so from. So that's what I'm really Absolutely. talking about. Absolutely. I was making kind of a radical statement. If you're waiting on the church to change your life or you're waiting on Pastor Tim or anybody else to, to fix you, they may be able to help. And Pastor Tim says wonderful things from the pulpit. Classes bring out things. People will pull you aside and here's the way I do it. This would help whatever. Or sometimes they may even get in my face and say, Ray, that's not the way to do it. You're going to hurt yourself. Those kind of things are good, but ultimately who's responsible for who you are and what you become? It is you. So don't rely on those kind of things. They're great things and we need each other. So you're right. That has to happen. But if we, think, if we think it's our responsibility to fix people around us, we will just go nuts and they will too. Eula. Well, I've always heard it said that you can only minister or if you want teach someone who's willing to be ministered or taught, oh, right. ministered to. Or right. So, and if you have that heart, then they, people can be very helpful. Right. And, and, you know, one of the fivefold ministries of the church is teaching. Right. And, and it's teaching the word, which is like what you're doing tonight. And the word is what changes people, but they have to be willing to internalize it and apply it. Right. I, you hear people say, I left that church because I just wasn't being fed. Yeah. That is a bunch of nonsense. That's not the reason you leave a church. If things are like that in that church, get involved and help it for crying out loud. When, pe when people do that kind of thing, for, it, I would just outright say that's sin. Get involved and make those kind of things work. Be part of the teaching, be part of it. Pastor, somehow I'm just not growing. What can I do? There you go, I bet there will be a list. <laughs> the things that you can get involved in. Make sense? So I, you know, I agree with what you say. We're all here to help each other, but particularly in relationships, I was referring to marriage as one thing and the other. It drives me nuts. And I've tried to fix Bev. <laughs> She's tried and tried to fix me. Yes, yeah, she sure does. She's got her hands full. But the whole point is, that's not her job, that's not my job. My job is to live like Ray's supposed to, and then I can really help her. Bev's job is to, and she's great at it. I was making fun that she's trying to fix me. There's some things that she said that I really had to work on. But if you see them backsliding, should you bring it up? Sure, you, ha you have to talk about things. I'm not saying that. But be careful that you feel like you're responsible to get them fixed. Right, yeah, right. You know, we do have to, to, to speak into each other's life. I'm not saying that you just sit by and watch them go crazy. You have to speak, but you don't take responsibility for them. You're responsible to them to live in the way you're supposed to. Um, I, I'm, you know, I'm responsible for my household and the way it runs and, you know, as the head of the house and bed with the things she's responsible for. But if I sit back and just try to, you know, you, you know, you need to do this and you need to do, you know, that's not going to work. It's not our job to try to fix each other. Anyway, we got off on a tangent there. All right, that's good. 
First Peter 5, uh, 1, 5 through 9 says, for this very reason, make every effort to add, and this is where we kind of stopped last time. We spent some time on it. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith. And then it gives a list of seven things to add to your faith. And it's interesting the way that it says it, because it add this, then it appears that it's saying, now add this, now add this. And so let me go through those. Add to your faith goodness, and to your goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness mutual affection, and to mutual affection love. Seven things. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, growth, growing, increasing measure, uh, measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive. In other words, it's translating into faithfulness as action. It'll keep you from ineffectiveness and unproductive in your knowledge in the Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed of past sins. That's a pretty strong statement. That if you don't have these things in growing measure that you're adding them to your faith, it says that you're nearsighted, blind, and you've forgotten that you've been forgiven of your past sins. Bam. How does that strike you? So we need to talk about this. That's 1 Peter 1, 5 through 9. So tonight, what I want to do is pick up where we were. We talked about these and kind of defined them, but I want to spend a little bit more time on them and then go on to some other things. Um, Roughly defined, these seven things evidently nourish, grow, and build our faith in ways that they're supposed to. According to this passage, true maturity begins with faith and culminates in love. It says, you've got faith, now add this. And what's the last thing you're going to add to it? Love. Step by step by step by step. And it ends at the, the major statement about love. So let's break these traits down. Let's redefine them as we did last week. It says, add to your faith goodness. Somebody tell me what goodness is. Somebody. I, if I, somebody doesn't answer these things, I'm going to assume that nobody's got them, so you need to answer them. <laughs> okay, Dale. Good. It's okay, just good. Doing. Okay, good. good. I mean, you know, the root word is, comes from good. Okay, that's good. Good. You know, good is the opposite of bad. Okay. You do good things. I do good okay. things. Ad Tim, I'd say, Tim, you look great tonight. It's great to see you. That is a good thing. Okay, so, good. Okay, good. Any other words come to mind, Bill? Back over here in the back, Will. Um, good is Christ-like, or the Word. Good, okay, good. Yeah, that's very good. Oh, so you're looking, on, so you're looking for synonyms? Okay, good. Well, oh, seven, oh, what are the seven things? Goodness, knowledge? We are, we, I was reading from uh, 1 Peter 1, 5 through 9. Oh, is it 2 Peter? I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. 2 Peter, thank you for pointing that out. 2 Peter 1, 5 through 9. Okay. Now you can give me the answer since you found the verse. Oh, Bill, back over here. I, th I think goodness is, a, is an attitude as well, you know, uh, because of what you have become as a Christian, 
the good that you do, the things that you see, whether it's helping someone or saying something kind or, or being good, as Dale was kind of doing, is an attitude I think we have to take. So uh, goodness is something who we become. So we have that attitude of doing good, being good, and doing the things that are necessary to be the right type of Christian. So you try not to be angry, you know, you try to do all those things. Right, the things we're going to define. Yeah, right, that's right. good. That's good. Dale? Well, my version I just read was... Now, Dale, you I'm sorry. The version I just read uh, um, called goodness virtue. And so I looked up virtue, which is a high moral standard. So we have high moral standards. Good. Those are the two words I was looking for, was virtue and moral excellence. Now, let's look at the word virtue. If somebody is virtuous, they're good, but what does that mean? If I am filled with virtue, what does that mean? Huh? <laughs> what pops into my head is walking down the street with your your lady and there's a puddle and, 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 and you throw your coat on the ground so she doesn't walk in the puddle that's virtuous uh, there's another word that we have for that uh, chivalrous that's, that's chivalrous but, but, right but it's it's virtuous you're doing good things for people it's not inward it's reaching out to others, doing good things for them. Okay, I think virtue is purposely seeking the right good thing. And, you know, that means that you have to think about it. You've got to make choices to say, this is what I stand for. This is what I mean. Bill talked about this a couple of weeks ago in class where he said, you make up your mind ahead of times how you're going to act. And that becomes a standard as soon as you came, come across it because this is who I am. This is what I mean. Will. So my study Bible, um, which is NIV, um, it says the practice of moral discipline. Good. If you've got a moral, it talked, we, uh, we talked about the word moral excellence. Moral is an understanding, morality is the understanding of what is right and what is wrong. We live in a day to where this on a spectrum of one to 10, and death in is one to 10, everything's gray. You know, depending on what you want to do, you kind of slip back and forth between it. No, things are right, they are wrong. Things are black and white, so to speak, in terms of this is the things you should do, this is things you should do. These are things you should think about, these are things you shouldn't be thinking about. You should take your mind captive. So anyway, Goodness. You work at being good. You work at thinking good. You think you work at doing the right things for people. That means there's some thinking. I don't know about you, but lots of times I just don't think. And I say things, I do things, I walk off into things, and I cannot believe what I did, what I said. A lot of backing up, a lot of prayers, a lot of forgiveness ask because I haven't cultivated it good enough sometimes, and before I know it, I'm right there. The more you cultivate this goodness, the easier it is not to step into that stuff, right? But that's personal. It's me deciding that, that that's what I'm going to be. So it says, okay, add to your faith goodness, but then it says, add to your goodness knowledge. What's knowledge? Reading the word of God. Okay, knowledge, understanding of the word of God. Learning. Learning. Knowing, knowing you know, the root word of knowing. That means you see something, and now it's yours. You... Knowing, yeah. knowing what's right and wrong. Knowledge, okay. that way you can be good. You know what's good. You know what's not good. Good. It is things that you learn and embrace. There's all kinds of knowledge out there, but what I end up knowing and embracing and making mine, that knowledge now is mine to do with what I want to. And I can be cynical, 
I can be mean, I can be negative, I can be down, I can just wallow in things, or with that knowledge I can say, I'm gonna rise above this, because it's an option to do whatever you want to with it. I'm gonna use this knowledge for growth, I'm gonna use this knowledge to become the person I should be, I'm gonna use this knowledge to say I do this, I don't do that. If you don't know, how can you act? So you have to know. And as was said, I don't know who said it, but the word of God. Well, it was um, Dale. He said, you know, you get it from the word. Obviously, I, I did a sermon, um, must have been quite a few months ago, on the book of James, and I talked about the nuggets. And we've kind of been raised, that, you know, the commandments of God, I do this, don't do that, and that's what Christianity is about, the do's and the don'ts. I get to do this, I get to do that, I get to not, I can't do this, I can't do that. Bible is full of nuggets say, do it this way. It's a commandment, strong suggestion in some places, but look at the nugget of it. If I will learn that and I will do that, what happens? I won. I grasp something. I become something different. Oh, there's another nugget. There's another thing. Well, with this knowledge, once you understand it, you get to, be able to grasp those things and it begins to transform you, it begins to change you because you make the choice, ah, I found something. I can change and we're gonna find things tonight. Okay, then it says, add to your knowledge, <laughs> we don't like this one, self-control. By grab, nobody's gonna tell me what I can and cannot do. And if you insist on it or you get offended, that's your problem. You know, we go on and on about, you know, um, it's about self. Well, the whole thing about self-control, and this is straight from the word, self-control has to do with the two words, self and I will control self. That means I will speak this, I won't speak that. I will be angry, I won't be angry. I will love, I will not love. I will sulk and carry on or I won't. <laughs> I mean, I can go on with the list of things that we decide to do and not do, but self says I control what I'm going to do. In the context of everything, self-control is saying I will self-control myself to do right. I will self-control to know what's right. I will self-control to when I am tempted to not, or do, uh, not do something or do something. Choice, I get to choose. Okay, yes, right here. You got that really warm. <laughs> um, Self-control is, as most of us realize, uh, is not easy. No. <laughs> and um, I would be the first one to admit that I have a temper Yes. I, I, had I, heard ta I had heard tales, I don't know, yeah, but yeah, I... Yeah. <laughs> and and uh, my, my first tendency is to react, not respond. So, um, hey, no comments over there. He's... So, one of the things I'm still learning about self-control is that I need help. And the only time that it really works for me is when I ask the Holy Spirit to help me with that and say, Holy Spirit, you need to help me stop instead of react and wait so I can respond. And it doesn't work all the time because we always have that choice. And sometimes it just happens before you can stop it. Well, it, it, it is, is a wildfire. It is an extremely... Um, deceptive, devious thing of Satan. I mean, he can use that. Every one of us, I think, here rises up and before you know it, you know, there it is. But you have to control. In other words, that means we have the knowledge that this is wrong or this is okay. This is wrong. And then it's up to self to say, I will control that. Right, yeah. Real quick, what I got out of that, what, what was really neat, is through what you're saying, you're not taking away your opportunity to respond. So you're not depriving yourself of who you are or whatever, 
but you're tempering it. You're using knowledge and wisdom to respond. And so you don't become a doormat. And you know, sometimes in terms of self-control, it's okay to let people walk. Yes. By grab, you're not gonna get my, you know, just let it go. Let it go, pick your battles, that's good. You've gotta be very, very careful with this. But you know, a lot of us you know, that are married, we understand what we're talking about, but this gets into the church thing, it gets into the workplace, it gets into so many different areas to where, you know, we, well, I'm gonna talk about it a little bit later, but we live in a, we live in a, a world today where things are nuts. And everything in me wants to rise up and scream at people with, with, with the foolishness and one thing and the other that's going on and how people are deceived. Probably it's not wise in terms of self-control to do that. And, and I'm gonna talk about that a little bit later. I'll hold, put that on hold. I, <laughs> Go ahead, Bill. I, I think the, the self-control piece kind of goes back to what I said, you repeated about making a decision beforehand, and then when the choice comes up, you make the right choice because you've already decided. But it's the self-control piece is the practical application of that because it's harder to get to that point where if my problem is anger, as Eula was saying, or, or it may be a habit, whatever it might be, the self-control is stacked on top of faith and everything else. So. This is another step in maturing that we're talking about. So practicing that and, and getting to that point where, okay, I've made a decision, but now how do I act on that? So the self-control is what can I do to, when I get to that point, how do I make that right decision? How do I control that? I mean, you can say, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to control myself, and you can say that well, but you know, there are things that we have problems with all the time that causes issues or we wouldn't be talking about this so much about self-control. So it's practicing that application about those decisions that's really difficult. But I think the key is finding that, um, that um, would be the right trigger to stop you from making the wrong choice. Even though you've made a decision, you have to find the right trigger to make the right choice at right. that point. You know, How I do you do that? that? That would be. And remembering when that when that happens, oh yeah, this is one of those decisions I made already. Reminding yourself, but there's so many things out there that you know, billboards, computers, TV commercials, one thing and the other, absolutely riddled with sex. We have to make decisions. I'm going to do like Job. I made a, you know, made a covenant that I would not allow myself to look at such things. Really paraphrasing, but you say I'm not going to go there, and I make that choice. And once I see it, I have the choice now of control, and I say, self, don't go there. Turn away. Stop that. There's opportunities at work where you know the boss is just driving me nuts because. This is the way they think, the way they do things. Scripture's got a lot to say the way you ought to handle your job. And that's not running around talking to the other employees about your company or your boss. That's not what a Christian does. That doesn't mean you agree with it, what they're doing is right or whatever. But you stand at the cooler and you just badmouth the people that are paying you that are the boss. It's their choices, their decisions. Self-control. Now, does it mean you can't sit down and talk to the boss about concerns? No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying, though, the gossip and the stuff that we do and we run around trying, we just can't stand it. We, we're not on the inside and don't know what's going on with the business or whatever. Your church or whatever, yeah. We just really, you know, we drive ourselves into these places where we shouldn't even go and say, wait a minute, I'm going to not go there. I'm going to control myself. You know, there's a, there's, well, you know, you have the option. I, I've got some good friends that are strong Christians, and their tool shed is filled with the tools of their job that they bring home. And you think, wait a minute, this is called theft? Self-control, I won't go there, it's not mine. You have this temptation. 
we just talked about, isn't it wonderful that in every temptation there's a way out of it? God's going to help you with that. Okay, we've got to move on. Did, did you have your hand up? I did, but you want to move on, so let's go. Okay. Okay. Add to your self-control perseverance. And so you just defined it, patience. What? I got to be patient on all this on top of everything? What is patience? <laughs> it's something that kids require. <laughs> <laughs> Bill. Uh, I, well, I think patience, if you want to look, about it, look at it as far as perseverance is being um, straightforward, moving the same direction, keep going the same way, and even though things come up to come back and you have to be patient about not being able to get through them, and so there's always the battle that we face to keep going, so we have to be patient with ourselves, with others, but perseverance to me is that, but also keep going in that same direction, straight forward with, uh, <laughs> with what we're trying to accomplish. Good. Eula. I am not very patient. He is patient. Um, one of the translations that I've read over the years is long suffering. Good. Lo and steadfast. Good. I think that the thing that sticks out to me, you don't give up on yourself, you'll get through this, and you don't give up on the situation, it'll work out. Just persevere with the things you know to do, all of those words. Perseverance is something that you, you have made a choice that, you know, I don't know, sometimes you just want to fix it. Yeah. You want to get in the middle of it and you want to get this taken care of. And, I want to talk about it, and I want to talk about it now, and I want to get this fixed, and I don't want to have to go to bed with it, you know, <laughs> whatever it is, if it's in the house, or you go at work, by the I'm going to go and seat the boss right now. You walk out losing your job because you weren't patient enough, you know. You have to be patient. Okay, step back, take a big breath, and let's take a look at this. Okay, maybe time is what is needed. I need to be patient with this. Who's got the mic? Somebody other, Dale. It has a negative connotation, meaning difficulty or it's not like perseverance means, well, things are going good. We're going fishing and we're catching all kinds of fish. Mm -hmm. There's a negative here. It's negative. We're not catching any fish. We're going to stay out on the lake all day. We're going to persevere until we catch a fish. <laughs> it's a, there's a negative connotation. You're fighting against a negative force. Well, sometimes it is. Sometimes you're fighting a negative force. And I think in context of this, Almost everything here is about growth. Therefore, it's going to be hard <laughs> to, to grow because change comes with difficulty and pain and that kind of thing. You know, uh, you know there's, we've, all, we've all heard it said, don't pray for patience because God will... You know, right, because, you know, that scripture says, the trying of your faith works patience. What? You mean that I got to go through the step to get patience? Well, sometimes, right. You know, some of the people that have had true tragedies in their life and you, they are talked to later on, they talk about how it changed their life. Things kind of came into perspective and they're a lot more patient with people and things or whatever because they went to hell and back. They went through the fire and when they came out, they had a different view of things. Anyway. Add to your perseverance or patience godliness. <laughs> oh, there's a tall order. Godlike. God Christian, Christ like. So we're doing these things, and ultimately, what that's leading us to adding a life that is godlike. We begin to think like God. We begin to hopefully act like God. We begin to respond like God. We begin to love like God. 
we begin to wish the best for other people like God, we begin to pray for people, we begin to intercede, we begin to share the gospel because of eternal life and the great message, we become a whole new person. We can't become God, but we can emulate who God is. Make sense? And so, it's being godlike. Then add to your godliness mutual affection. Huh? Okay, respect. Good. Anything else? Huh? What's that? I didn't understand it. Oh, lots of love. Good, okay. Well, one of the words I've got down is brotherly kindness. Brotherly means you embrace somebody like they're your own and you're kind to them. And uh, brotherly affection, true love, the essence of love. Bill. Well, I feel like it's, um, it's caring for your brother or your sister to the point where you truly are concerned about what's going on in their life and how they're feeling and what's going on. And, how can I pray for, like you were talking about the other part of that, but it, it, it's a, uh, I think it just gets bigger in our uh, caring for group. You know, we have our close friends and we have others in church, but I think as we become more affectionate and more like God, that we're going to care for more people, even those outside of church, to where we care what's going on in their lives and why are they on the street or what's going on and they're unsaved. So we care enough we're going to reach out and be willing to um, talk to them about the Lord, you know, witness or pray for them or whatever. I think a lot of times Christians aren't there because they are, they have that fear of what that could bring. But when we truly care and affection, have affection for others, then we will be willing to do that without um, being afraid or having well, fear or those types of things. And kind of what you're describing is costly. It, it takes a lot to be able to step into somebody's life. But brotherly kindness, you know, you become aware of the needs. I mean, your radar, bege- you, all of a sudden the radar picks up, oh my goodness. And you know to ask a question, you know to say, hey, you're doing all right, you be- and you listen. I'm telling you, I've said this a whole lot. If you want to counsel people or to kind of help them grow and do things, what's the biggest thing you can do? Listen to them. Shut up and listen to them. Okay? Now, it doesn't mean you don't, don't have input, but if your husband or your wife has got something, and I've had to train myself because my wife starts telling me she's struggling with this, and you're like, oh, here, let me fix that for you. Let me explain to you how, what you could do to fix No, shut up and listen, Ray. Let her talk about what she's going through. And it's hard to know when to jump in or whatever. But the same thing with, with people in our body. You ask questions and they be, it might even sound ridiculous. It might even be saying, really? That's bugging you? You don't say that, but you, you sit and you listen to them. And then you say the, 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 uh, the right word at the right time is to encouragement. And you'd be surprised if you just seek the Spirit to say, okay, tell me what to say and when to say it. And then just let God work. Pray with them. Just be there for them. So, godliness. Anyway, all of the attributes of God that we're trying to cultivate. And then finally it says, to your mutual affection, add love. So we've gone from faith We're going to talk about love here in a minute. But we're going to add to, we start with faith, and we begin to add these things. We begin to add these things. We begin to cultivate these things, and ultimately, ultimately, where does it take us? To love. And that's what this is all about. Love, I mean, we can begin to define that in all kinds of ways. True maturity begins when faith and culminates in charity, the full expression of love. In other words, love has, you know, we can go into agape, phileo, you know, all of the different Greek words for love and whatnot. 
But the whole point of this is a selfless understanding of what you're supposed to be to that person because of what Jesus has done for you. Agape love is loving in the deepest sense. It's interesting that it says add to, add to, add to. It's like there's an internal uh, integral process. And I don't think it's a mistake that these were done in this order because they're saying add to this. And if we begin to cultivate this, and you say, okay, I've got faith. Okay, I'm going to start practicing, good, practicing goodness. You can't camp there, but you begin to cultivate those things. You say, okay, I need some knowledge about what these things are. You begin to grow, and you begin to in, you know, work that into your goodness. You take your self-control, and you say, okay, that means I'm gonna have to discipline myself about how I do these things. I gotta quit this, I gotta do this. See what I'm saying? Love alone has the power to give you insight and discernment into life choices that keep us pure, blameless, as we wait for the return of Christ. Isn't that an interesting comment that these things can keep you blameless? Now we know that the blood of Jesus constantly cleanses us and we're blameless before the Father, but sin is always there. What happens? We know these things, we repent of these things, we turn from them, we stop doing this, stop doing this, and we become more and more and more the people that we're supposed to be. Love is not, if, if love is not abiding in, uh, abiding in our life, what is? Pride. Because pride is about me, love is about the others. Okay, 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7. We know this scripture. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not boast. What's that about? D do I need to do some self-control? <laughs> okay. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs, love does not delight in evil but rejoices in the truth, it always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always preserves, and always perseveres. I like one of the, I think it's the New Living Bible, it talks about love hardly even notices when someone else does it wrong. Whew. That one hits me between the eyes because, you know, we kind of know oh, that wasn't the way to do that. Or, what, you know, when somebody messes up with me, that's not, you know, hardly even notices when the other one does it wrong. I like the way the message translates love. Do you want to hear? <laughs> Love never gives up. Love cares more for others than for self. That's scripture. It says, regard others better than yourself. Really? And when I think about it, there's a lot of people that got way more together than I do sometimes. Regard them better than yourself. Love doesn't want what it doesn't have. That's good. Love doesn't want what it doesn't have. Give me, I want this, I want that, I want this, I want that, I want that. They've got honor, I want the honor. You know, I mean, it can be things, it can be issues, it can be people, you know. Love, I like this one, love doesn't strut. <laughs> love doesn't strut. <laughs> What'd you say? Do that again. No. <laughs> yeah, well, my brothers. <laughs> you know, that's on camera now. I'm in trouble. <laughs> okay, love doesn't strut. Doesn't have a swelled head. Doesn't force itself on others. You will think the way I think. You won't act this way. 
you will do this. We don't force ourselves on others. It isn't always me first. Doesn't fly off the handle. She was, she was good to confess. Now don't be, quit looking at her. <laughs> She's not the only one in the room, I know that. Doesn't keep score of sins of others, right? Boy, we do that with people we're close to. You always do this, you know, this, you yes, do this, and you did this, and you did this, and this goes back 25, 30, 40 years, and we drag it all out. We talk about it. You don't keep score. Doesn't revel when others grovel. That's an interesting one. People that have to back up, and they're having to, you know, kind of, well, anyway, you get it. Takes pleasure in the flowering of truth. Flowering of truth. Another, can you see that? There's truth, and as it becomes evident, it flowers. It becomes, ev you know, beautiful, a thing that's strong. Puts up with anything. Whoa. Love puts up with anything. Trusts God always. Always looks for the best. Never looks back. But keeps on going to the end. Just reading those things, I mean, it just, <laughs> you know, makes me realize, man, I don't need to do this. See, there was knowledge right there. All of a sudden, that triggers discipline that says, self, these are things I need to be about. There's things you need to be about. See the power of these lists in Scripture? I love the lists in Scripture. There's these lots of places where do this, 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 how to. Great, that's how you do it. <laughs> First Corinthians 13, 13 says, and now these th three things remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Good. So, if the seven Christian growth traits grow us, it in, and it ends in love, I want to ask a question, a test. How you doing? If these things, well, the thing is, these things are here to say, you know, if it wasn't attainable, God wouldn't put it there. If it wasn't something that we could go, you know, sometimes I feel like I'm way back at the beginning of the list working on this stuff. But you keep on. There's that perseverance, the patience to make it happen. Think about these things. How can we apply the things that we've just talked about to our acquaintances? People we know, people we work with, our fellow uh, Christians people that we have acquaintances with in our neighborhood, people that um, uh, you go to events and you get to know. How do these things apply? How are you doing with living this in front of people? How about your marriages? How are these things doing? It's, you know, it's probably one of the seed beds of one of the, one of the most, um, um, tumultuous things that can happen because we take advantage of each other. We take each other for granted and oh, he'll be here, she'll be here and we let her fly. No, can't do that. So we have to understand these things. How's it doing with your families, your, your children, your extended families? What about your church? How are these principles working? How's it doing on your job? You name the list. Are you allowing the life of Christ in you to live through you? You got faith, the life of Christ is in you. What are you doing with it? Do those who know you have any questions about the fact that there's a savior in your life? Do they know that he's there? Are you willing to be persecuted for righteous living? 
because what we've been talking about is righteous living and people aren't going to like that. Down through time, a lot of people have and still are dying for those things. And the way things are going, guys, <laughs> I'm wondering where that's going to end. Yeah, <laughs> right, but where's it going to end in our, our, on our watch with what we're doing? Philippians 1.20 says, I uh, eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or whether by death. You hear those kind of statements from the disciples all the way through Scripture. God has placed us here on earth, and he's got a purpose. You've heard me do sermons on this. You've heard me talk about it. Every one of you have got a purpose. There's no mistake that you're here. He knows you're here, knew you would be here. Scripture even says, I knit you. I knew where you would live. I knew your name. I put into you the things that I wanted you to have with your abilities, your skills, your talents. And I offered you salvation. What are you going to do with it? You've taken it. Everybody here taking it? Everyone here born again believers? Awesome. Now you've taken it. What are you going to do with it? What are you doing with the few things that God has entrusted you with? I don't care whether you're where you're working, I don't care what's happening in your marriage, I don't care what's happening with, well, I care, but it's, <laughs> it doesn't matter. You've got to make choices in spite of the difficulty, the harassment, the hassles, the good, the bad, the ugly, all of it. You have to make the choice, okay, this is who I am. God entrusted me with things. I'm going to find out what those things are, and I'm going to do something about it. That's the discipline, the self, I'm going to do something, I'm going to persevere. Does the word faithful describe your walk of faith? Are you faithful with these things? In spite of a coronavirus, in spite of financial struggle, in spite of marriage trouble, in spite of a job, in spite of, in spite of, in spite of, are you letting God work in faith with those things? We live in a world that's got all kinds of stuff going on. Can all of these things bring us to a point to where we are grateful to hear someday Jesus say, well done? Because of the choices you made day by day by day. Do you get the feeling that happiness really here is associated with faithfulness? Because if you could really walk on those things, you could really begin to overcome those things, if you could really begin to feel worth that Jesus is really beginning to do some things because you let him, it seems to me the faithfulness equates to spiritual security and happiness right here where we're living. It could bring things, uh, it could bring people like Paul to say, to live as Christ, to die as gain. I mean, I'm going to do all I can here, but if I get to go home, I'm happy, I'm content. It's just a good, good thing. 1 Corinthians 4, 2 says, Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Every one of you are stewards of the gifts I just talked about. You've been entrusted with those things. What are you going to do with them? Now, the message here isn't meant to be, <laughs> this sounds pretty hopeless. I got all this to do. With. You're doing fine. But you see the order of you begin to you step into it, begin to embrace it, begin to say, okay, that's not what I'm going to do. I'm going to change. I'm going to do, you know. You make those things work for you. <clears throat> I really love the scripture, uh, the story that Jesus was uh, talking to his disciples. And... Um, he was telling, that they, they were asking how, how much should you forgive? And he said, you should forgive seven times in one day. S 
seven times. Oh, the offerings get, uh, back, uh, pass it around with you. Those of you who want to put your offering in uh, tonight. He go, uh, Jesus says, so watch yourselves. If your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. And if they repent, forgive them. So somebody does something wrong, you can say, wait a minute. And they say, oh, well, forgive me. And um, it says, even then, if seven times in a day, seven times they come back and say, I repent, forgive them. <laughs> and the thing that really is interesting to me, you did, do you remember what the response of the apostles were when he told them? You'd give, you know, you forgive them seven times in one day. They said, Lord, increase our faith. How in the world? And that came straight from Jesus. He said, forgive them. Why? Because we have been given a lifetime of sin, and we are eternally saved. So scripture increases our faith, the action of that scripture in our lives. We really live in a strange time, as I talked about a while ago. Have you no uh, noticed that there's a bunch of nuts running around? <laughs> there's a bunch of idiots doing a uh, probably should, I probably shouldn't, shouldn't use those words. That wasn't very loving, wasn't it? No, it wasn't. But yes, yeah, right. <laughs> but, but yeah, right. <laughs> but yeah, well, never mind. But it just drives me nuts what people are doing, all the way from those that are in the street to the, to the politicians, to what's going on worldwide, the lies, the, we live in a nutso time. So how in the world are we or Christians supposed to do, do something about it? If I grab them, I want to go out there and shoot them. I've got a brother in town, listen to me, I've got a brother in town that has got his armor and he said, I'm going where the trouble is. Got a gun? He's all ready. Okay, now, Jesus came and died for us. Now what? What is that all about? Do you think that's the way that a Christian is supposed to respond? Doesn't mean we can't we we can we can disagree with everything. Don't misunderstand me. We say this is wrong. This is the way it should be, and we can vote, and we you know we can make a stand for what we feel about. But how in the world does the love of Jesus from Christians get through all of this stuff? You see, we have a standard we got to live to, no matter what the world's doing, and that's a real challenge because it's hard. Okay, real quick, I want to finish up with promises. There's a scripture that says, well, you remember the story of Abraham. Abraham was given a promise. Somebody tell me the story real quick. What was Abraham's promise? Tell the story and what happened. And you will, yeah. Okay, good. You, you, you start off right. I will give you a son and what? And he would, he would be, be the many father nations. of many nations. Right, a promise, a strong promise. Did it happen? Not for... It didn't years. happen for a long time. What happened? He got to be how old? 100. 100 years old, and he still hadn't seen the promise. And it said that Sarah, the, you know, they were thinking, well, Sarah's drying up. She's not going to be able to have. <laughs> That's what. That's what it says. I, I'm, use, I'm, use, I'm using. No, that's, that's, that's what Scripture says. That's what Scripture says. Scripture uses that term. And she, so she says, well, we'll fix this, you know, and we, Hagar, you know, all of the stuff. And the, yeah, anyway, there's this long, long thing. And then it goes on to say, yet he did not waver with unbelief. He regarded the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had. This is why, now listen to this, 
This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. Faith is what he had. He believed. And because of his belief, it was credit to his account, so to speak, as righteousness. Because he had faith. If you have faith and you believe the things we've been studying, that they can affect your life, they may not be coming. It may be 100 years old. But you keep on. And you seek this promise and believe that God will do these things in you. Guess what? It'll be counted to you as righteousness. And I got proof. If you read on in the same text, it says, now listen to this. The words that was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also to us, to whom God will credit righteousness. For us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, he was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. Isn't that powerful? That belief, this faith that we're all striving for, that I will do this, I don't care, it's not working, but I believe it's going to happen. I'm going to live in this. I'm going to add to my faith virtue. I'm going to add, I'm going to grow these things in my life. It will change you. And all of that will be counted to you as righteousness. Now, your righteousness doesn't save you. It's your faith in Jesus. But the response of that faith that is a growing faith means you're faithful. And therefore, you are viable. You will be used in the kingdom. Here's the point. God made a promise to Abraham. He believed and kept believing. It was credited as righteousness to Abraham. Believing his faith and seeing the promises of God fulfilled increases faith. We just read that it is the same for you and I. That belief is counted to us as righteousness. It's estimated that there are over 3,000 promises in Scripture. Find them. Believe them. Live them. Walk them out. And every time a promise is there and you believe it in faith, it's counted to you as righteousness. And as you grasp it, you become more righteous. We're not, you become more like God. You keep on growing. Now, none of us have arrived. None of us will ever totally arrive. That's not the point. But you keep on. You persevere. You begin to work through this. Here's another little list. We've got a couple of minutes. Colossians 3, 8 through 10 says, Here's little nuggets, guys. Again, I was talking about nuggets instead of commands. But now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these. Uh-oh, here comes another list. Rid yourself of anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off the old self with its practices and then put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the, in the image of its creator. See these, the, 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 the words we've been talking about keep on popping up through the scripture. The knowledge that you have, the renewing. Anyway, I think it's time that every one of us here take responsibility for our lives, to rid our si ourselves of those things that do not represent God, to rid ourselves of those things that aren't godlike in our relationships, wherever we are. We need to walk away from bitterness, from negativity, from you know, wallowing in our stuff. It's still going to be there. And I, right there with you, you know, struggling with a lot of those things sometimes. But I got to keep reminding myself. And if I read the word, it keeps on saying, Ray, look, listen. Bev and I have got a, a couple of friends. It's a young couple that live a couple of houses down from us in the neighborhood. And uh, they're, they're young people. They're uh, 
uh, very young, they've got a newborn infant, and they head up a ministry on campus called New Life Campus Ministry. And uh, they've got this neat thing. So he sends out a little newsletter that he and I talk all the time, and so anyway, he sends me his little newsletter. But he asked in the newsletter, he said, tell, let me see, what, what was the question? What is some, something positive you have gained during this corona outbreak? And here's a bunch of students in the comments. And they said, well, I've been able to uh, dedicate more time to God throughout my day and, and uh, get into the Bible and begin to truly understand God's promises for me. I thought, hey, that's just what I was talking about. What a way to use the time we've got. We're kind of stuck at home. In other words, there's an increased confidence in my ability to hear God and believe his promises for my life. They're spending time. These are students. Um, another one said, how have you used your time to grow in your relationship with God? I now pray, pray every day. I ride out of prayer. And three things I am thankful for every single day. What is something for, well, anyway, it went on with a lot of the different things. But the point was, I thought, out of the mouth of, you know, these new Christians, they may have been a Christian a long time, but, you know, a word for us older people looking at these youngsters in college in spite of what's going on. What great testimonies from young people. Here's another, here's another growth scripture. You ready? Therefore, this is uh, Colossians 3.12, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion. That enfolds you. You're compassionate to people. Instead of brash or putting them down or the wise comment or the, you know, the constant joking or whatever. We're compassionate with people. And there's nothing wrong with some of that stuff, but you can see what I'm saying? But it gets to be a diet of that. It can just begin to tear people down. So become compassionate, kindness, humility. Oh my. <laughs> thinking of others better than yourself. Gentleness, patience. Just pick one of those and start working on it. Just one of them. It'll change our lives. Okay, that's enough for tonight. I hope you understand, I hope you understand that when somebody like me gets up here and kind of lays it out, you know, the way it ought to be, one thing or the other. I mean, I read these and it just makes my head turn and I kind of think, oh my Ray. So I've not arrived. I'm struggling with the same things you are. You know, I have to deal with things in a marriage same as you do. I have to deal with things in my work the same as you do. I have to deal with this thing called the corona just like you do. I mean, same thing in my life. But you've got to encourage me. I've got to encourage you. We need to say, you can do this. You can do this. The thing that's gonna end all of this someday is the Lord's return. And we don't know when that's gonna happen. Come Lord Jesus, but still, there's a lot of stuff that's going on. We've got kids we've got to sow into. We've got workers that need to know Jesus. We've got a church that needs to grow and flourish and we need to do our part and it's not about agreeing, agreeing with anybody about any of this. It's about finding who you are and saying, this is where I stand. And this is what I'm going to do. This is the way I'm going to handle it. It comes down to choices. Make sense? Yep. Good. So go and do it. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word that is so filled with challenge and encouragement and promises. And I pray that we would become the people of God that we are called to be, that we would grow, that we would add things to our lives that we should, that we would uh, take your scripture and that we just literally come alive, not only in what we read, but in the manifesting in our life. So Father, I pray that your word would uh, be cultivated in every way Pray that you would watch over, bless us in these times. I pray a special covering over this church, 
over everyone here, of all the families that are represented, all of our body, that you would keep us safe in these times of the virus. I pray, Father, for wisdom about what we do about those things. I thank you that we are in a place where we can worship you in our homes, in the streets, in this building. And I pray that we would just uh, take advantage of that. There's so much of the world that can't. And I pray, Lord, we would be faithful, that we would be servants that truly serve you in the best way we can. Where we need to change, uh, we just invite you into our lives to make choices that we should, that you would, uh, you have permission to get on her stuff. And I pray we would have hearts that are soft enough to listen and change. So we ask for your strength, your grace, and your mercy. And we thank you for them in the name of Jesus. Amen.